I am back and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to interview another legend in this series. And today I'm gonna to be talking with Rick Goins and I want you to uh, know a little bit about, about Rick uh, before we get started. And I'm gonna be reading from a piece of paper to make sure I don't miss anything in case you're noticing that my eyes drop. But Rick Goins is chairman emeritus of Tupperware Brands. During his successful career, Goins held a number of global senior management positions in Europe, Asia, and the US, and was an outspoken advocate in redefining business as something that served not only shareholders, but all stakeholders, including customers and employees. Humanitarian and philanthropic efforts have been a central focus of Rick's career, and he served as an engaged member of the World Economic Forum, the National Board of Governors for Boys and Girls Clubs of America, where he also served as chairman of the board for many of those years, and was an inaugural champion with United Nations He For She Women's Initiative, where he was a founding member of the Leadership Advisory Council. Now, it's my pleasure to be with this legend today, who I happen to know, and uh, I consider him a personal friend because he is responsible for a major segment in my personal involvement with direct selling. And uh, Rick, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along, but I don't mind by starting with this fact. Had it not been for Rick Goins, I would not have spent so many glorious, wonderful years learning and working with some of the greatest people that I've ever had a chance to work with at Avon Products. And it kind of all started with this man who you will get to know over the next few minutes. So Rick, uh, my pleasure, my honor, and you are a direct selling legend. So I have a few questions and I'm gonna start with the first one. And my first question is, what inspired you to get involved in a direct selling business? And as you respond to that, you're talking to me, but don't forget, uh, this is also going to be viewed by many people. And who knows uh, how significant this becomes as part of the historical record of the direct selling channel of distribution. So I want you to also tell us a little bit about where you were in life at that moment uh, that you decided that you wanted to be involved in direct selling. So tell us a little bit about you and uh, hopefully you can shed some light on my question. My friend, first thing, it's, uh, it's good to be with you and uh, for us to reconnect because um, we were very much uh, uh, friends uh, in the early stages of both our career. And then I left the U.S. for other places in the world. And, but we find ourselves reconnected again. And that's uh, a real blessing. Uh, I, I've got to say it. I, I've never really looked at, I uh, made a decision to get involved in direct selling. I got involved in businesses and their channel of distribution just happened to be direct to the consumer. I, I, there's never been a more unlikely person uh, to, to, to rise to the to CEO of, you know, we were at Tupperware, probably uh, the most revered brand of a direct seller in the world. And for me to be for a quarter of a, of a uh, century CEO there, let me turn the clock back real quickly because <laughs> it wasn't likely. Right before, you know, this is school in the Navy. I did a stint trying to sell encyclopedias. I spent three months trying to sell encyclopedias. And I got to tell you, I never made a sale. Never made a sale. I wasn't aggressive enough on cold calls at the front door. I didn't really enjoy uh, that. And, uh, you know, I really put my tail in between my legs at the end. Of, <laughs> I joined the Navy and, and that was an important, uh, that's why I 
cars I drive every day, I have a big Navy bumper sticker because that's when starting there that I first uh, was had leadership assignments from not only uh, early training that I would put in charge of the company, but then uh, I was assigned to a warship and immediately sent to the bridge of the ship. And I spent my time in the, in the Navy as a navigator, but um, that's when I really started to feel uh, an interest in understanding human motivation uh, and, and started to figure out what I was gonna do with the rest of my life. So after school, it was actually my senior year, I, um, I had a friend come in. I was working at a very high end uh, men's clothing store and he was, he was in law school and he came in and he had an idea that uh, he had a, it looked like a boat horn back then, but it had a cover on it. And it was basically a fire detector, a heat detector. And what happened is there was a little soft lead in there and it went, you know, about six inches down from the ceiling. And uh, the first minute of a fire, it would generally, it would go off. Uh, and he said, I'm gonna start a company doing this. Well, I, uh, I actually got so engaged in it and I said, wow, what a purpose here because most people who are dying in home fires die between 10 at night and six in the morning. My God, I can even remember that get in demonstration and close. Yeah. So I worked with him for about a year, but then there were some real issues with regard to what I felt, felt values wise in the company. So I created my own, I named it Dynamics, uh, moved it to Charlottesville, Virginia, brought most of my guys with me. Um, and I've got to tell you, I had a 10 year run that, that was just fabulous. And uh, then the federal government legislated heat and smoke detectors and they started basically giving away what we were selling. So I had to make a big pivot. You know, I, I often kept it a secret. Then in my 30s, I created this company, Fortunate Corporation, Fortunate Pet. And if I showed you the element today, you would say, wow, that's really great. Well, let me tell you, at the end of that story, I lost all the money I made in my 20s and my 30 with for, Fortunate Pet. And it was direct to the consumer too. And that's why often people have asked me, well, why in the heck did you join Avon? And I kid and I said, let's see. Oh, I remember I needed a job. But, and the reason, a big message to everybody on this, I initially licked my wounds about success in here. It didn't work this way. At Avon, everything I learned in my 20s and 30s, I was able to apply. I was a general manager all those times. I was the CEO. And Avon had so many silos of leadership. John, you knew this uh, when you came there. And you came there, you were also a general manager. And so uh, that was just a most important business decision I ever made was when I, when I joined Avon. Uh, what a wonderful place to land. And I remember uh, some of those days because I came in not too long after you had been there. You had already started to establish a record as being a visionary, you were going to take this grand old lady in a different direction and things were beginning to change and it was an exciting moment in time. That's why I decided to uh, come on board and be a part of your ship. So let's pick it up from there again because the audience now understands that you started uh, very much like uh, anyone else you happen to have had an entrepreneurial mindset and you looked at it for business reasons, maybe more so than just starting as an independent contractor, but you certainly understood the nature of the channel. And that is people would have the opportunity to explain products and services to other people. Uh, this is a great story. So now let's go back, let's pick it up. And I'm going to ask you another question because 
now you have been involved in direct selling for a period of time. You have landed uh, in the biggest uh, of them all, Avon Products, Inc. When did you make a commitment that direct selling was the right choice for you? Evidently, when you got to Avon, you had decided that this is the kind of business that you want to be involved in. Is there any particular moment in time when you knew you wouldn't go back to something else? Can you hone in on that and tell us what really occurred in your mindset that motivated you to continue on this unbelievable career that you have been living up? No, I mean, John, there really was no epiphany moment where at any time in my life where I said, I'm going to get involved in this channel. This is what I'm going to commit my, my life to. And, you know, I've been a part of so many studies that I've been the one pressing the studies of individuals who get involved in, in, in selling direct to consumer for 20, 30, 40 years. And for the bulk of them, there never was a time that really they did it. Often they made the decision, I'm going to do this. I need supplemental money. Uh, oh, I like this product. I want to share it with my friends. And before you knew it, they're, they're involved and they're engaged. I, I want to men mention something also very important. Uh, I was just talking to somebody about this with regard to their own life about the subject of not everything works. I mean, I've always said about creating things, you design it, you launch it in a learning laboratory mo mode, you, uh, then you refine it or fix it, and then you scale it. Uh, things sometimes work and sometimes they, they, they don't work. But I tell you, every time I've ever been introduced, all they talk about is he's French Legion of Honor, he's this, he's that, he's this, and I get up immediately after that for all the commencements I've done in my life. And I dispel all of those. And I said, guys, I'm happy and blessed for all of those. But let me tell you about some of the failures, the face plants and the flops that I've had because those will happen to you. And by the way, they will make you. How you deal with those, how you pivot, uh, from those. So I always had a idea there was, I always had a, a way to, okay, if this doesn't work, do that. And you kind of get seasoned for that. I was Navy, but not a Navy SEAL. But I will tell you, if you ever watch what that training is really like, that training is six months of failures. So that when you're out there, boy, you can do it. Uh, you can do it. So, I mean, getting yourself, this is what's so beautiful about direct selling uh, is it's at a point in time, it's just you. And you've got to figure out how to really strengthen up to that situation. Sorry for not answering the question, John, but I didn't want to lose that thought. Yeah, that's a wonderful thought. And it uh, says to everybody, there was no one particular defining moment. No. You just kept continuing to learn and give and, and lead, by the way, uh, obviously in a very effective way. I remember you gave us the chance to fail at Avon. We knew that overall we would win because we were doing the right thing. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I had a lot of freedom to work with a lot of great people yeah. on the ideas that we were developing at that time. So now... You are in this business, and uh, I'm looking at you at C as CEO of Tupperware Brands, one of the uh, most reputable brands in the world. So tell us about some of the most memorable moments. Well, I I've got to tell you that uh, the, too many for the time we have to talk about individual success stories. But I will tell you what it enabled me to do firstly at Avon was to, uh, the, the, one of the big issues is with many Americans is they tend, we're a very proud and I would say a generous 
but also an arrogant culture. And we tend to look at everything through American eyes. Uh, uh, my being sent early on in Avon to, you know, a kid landing on the ground in Germany, and all I could say was hardly guten tag at that time. And all of a sudden I'm running a $150 million business. And then I get Austria. And then, uh, and then I get the call and they said, oh, we want you to move to Asia and you be in charge of all Asia Pacific and open China and all of that. Well, then I started to even there start to see cultures that were emerging markets where, you know, you had wealthy Europeans, but then you got over there where per capita incomes in some markets was $1,500 a year. So I started to really start to see, wow, this is the way, and, and this is the future. Uh, we have 4.5% of the world's population here. So it began an education to me on understanding different cultures. And if you meant what's memorable to me wasn't a long time ago, it was five years ago. I had a group called the Global Fairness Initiative. Uh, they're a nonprofit out of Washington, DC. They wanted to study the effects of somebody being involved in Tupperware. And we set the ground on, on for it. It had to be somebody involved three years at least. And they spent months and months and months in Mexico, which is a Catholic country, and in Indonesia, which is 85% Muslim. And both kind of emerging markets. But we wanted, the only reason I mentioned religion is that influences culture. Yes. And they wanted to find out what, what do I find here? And so I've felt, you know, for, uh, for some years, with somebody really good in direct selling, and I know, who, John, you are, you're a bit of an anthropologist. So you may not have pursued the, the architecture, but you sure did pursue the anthropology because it is basically understanding individuals and how to help move them from wherever they're, they are to however much better place they want to be. And you gotta help them see it. Here's what we Global Ferris Initiative came out with their findings. Same in both countries. Number one, they found women move from being lower class to middle class, check mark. Number two, she became with regard to attitude, she started with, I'm not good enough. And as we did the study, she moved to, I am good enough. And in both countries, Muslim and Catholic, she said, 30% of them said, actually, I'm good enough and I'm a leader. Uh, and next, uh, number three, one third uh, in the beginning uh, only had a cell phone or something. By three years involvement, 70% of them were connected with co computers, smartphones, connected to other women. And you want to get power? Give me one woman. You want to get real power? Connect women together. And last, and this is the thing I was so, so happy for, in a world where one out of three women is abused sometime in her life, physically, or emotionally, she said, he changed his attitude toward me and went from resentment to support. That's better than an individual success story because it was broad and sweeping. And I know the best direct selling companies, that's what they do. Rick, that is so good. Um... And I'm so glad that uh, Direct Selling News is documenting some of the thoughts and memories uh, of people like you. You said so much in that segment, and it reminded me of the way I define this channel of distribution sometimes. And when you talk about the different cultures and then the outcome of your survey, I often say that from my experience, this has to be one of the finest forces of good on planet Earth because of the way we can bring people together. Thank you so much for that. I'm glad to uh, have had the honor to be the one asking you that question about 
memorable moments. Can I add something to that? Because this is, you know, my 20 years in engagement with the World Economic Forum, I was blessed to head up uh, their whole gender parity program. Because when I first started attending Davos, there wasn't a single focus on women's issues and gender parity. And that's why we created at the United Nations, he for she, uh, because he controlled most of the jobs. And so we really started to do work there on that. But one of the things that we've been beating the drum uh, for, I get education is important and I get behind, behind that. But the bulk of women, when you look at the world's population, she, the reason she doesn't have the degrees, she never had the opportunity. And what, what, what we started working on, and this is a better story about what even makes me happy, I would see women who had no credentials, sometimes, and you have too, eighth grade education, has four kids, lives in a lean-to in the, in, in the Philippines, started with us because she didn't want flies to get in her food. And all of a sudden, she be, builds a huge or, organization. Here's the issue. Most of we measure intelligent is cognitive tests and hold yes. cognitive tests. I keep this on my cell phone. Qualities not measured by cognitive tests. And let me read this to you. Reliability, persistence, enthusiasm, courage, passion, discipline, motivation, and compassion. And I want to tell you a quick story. I have a lady picks me up here with Zoom. I didn't know it was going to be a lady. She picked me up, mm, probably 60, African-American, uh, little girl, probably 12 or 13, wasn't supposed to be there. It was in the car. I was going to dinner. I was going to have some red wine with a friend, and I wanted to drive back. Well, it was 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. I used the opportunity to interview her, and because she waited for me. Her name was Louise. I said, how long you been doing this? She said, three months. What were you doing before? Cleaning houses. Okay, uh, at Disney. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, you making more money? She said three times as much wow. money. And best of all, I can drop her off at school and pick her up in the evening. And then she drops us off on the way back. I said, tell me more. What'd you have to learn? She leaned around. She was so sweet. She, sa she said, uh, uh, I said, did you have to learn how to drive? She said, honey, I was driving at 14. Uh, and I said, okay. She said, don't tell anybody. And then she said, I knew Orlando. Uh, the only thing I had to learn was how to work this Uber stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I was just absolutely amazed at her. Uh, and that, oh, and by the way, I went down this list later and I said, she had these. Oh, and by the way, I found out the little girl wasn't her daughter. It was a homeless girl she had been raising for three years. Well, we have nearly 4 billion women in the world and most didn't get the benefit of those educations, but they've got this. And so yeah. when you come up with the earning opportunity to engage the things she knows how to do and the qualities she's already they had, well, that's one of those things they would say today, hiding in plain sight, women. That's what I mean. Most of the books you see around are about the power of women. And so I said my job became, how do I create platforms to leverage that power? Never been disappointed. Well said, my friend. Well said. You know, you and I have been involved, or in my case, observing uh, this model for a long time. We are at uh, a, a moment in time, some call it an inflection point. I'm just gonna say we are experiencing a moment in time when we reflect on the past, but most importantly, we are looking at what the future can be. 
Tell me a little bit about your outlook for the business model. You may be the chairman emeritus, but in your mind, I know Rick Goins is constantly thinking about where we go from here. I, I truly do believe, and I know you think this way hey, too, there, uh, there's a transformation occurring and it's not just driven by COVID-19. I have seen so much this transformation with regard to shareholder value. I was so sick and tired of that in certain markets of, uh, where all you're doing running your company is for shareholder value. And we had a group of us actually go and we spent three days with Pope Francis and to get him, him because he was already behind it, this idea of its stakeholder value. And what's the purpose of, of companies today to, the, to Mother Earth, to the consumers, the communities? Well, then we bring it down right down to this channel of distribution. I don't think there's been a sweeter spot for our channel of distribution. Uh, first thing driven by. The, um, the, the, the creation of this, all this technology with the internet, the, the phrase, uh, the $100 phrase of what that really is, is disintermediation, taking out everybody in between. And all of a sudden, it's from the producer or the seller, you know, right to the consumer on there. What that says is it spells opportunity that you do not have to have all these layers of distribution in between. So I make a mental, mental note of that. And that's one force driving it. Then I look at another force, culture. Uh, I love what we see about this starting, starting with millennials, those born after 79, God, the values that they have. They want to work for a company where they get a sense of purpose, the bulk uh, 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 of them. Here's another interesting thing. 59% of them don't want a job. Yes. They'd like to be doing their own. As you know, it came out of the, because you've written about it, came out of the music business. Hey, I got a gig tonight. And if you're going to make an income in in the music business, you gotta be able to stitch together gigs. That's what I see ahead, disintermediation. Okay, you're empowered. You can figure out how to do something with that. And oh, by the way, I didn't wanna work uh, nine to five. I wanna be off the clock. I and mean, we're only going on right now 150 years of the industrial age. The term nine to five came up at Ford Motor Company and you know, it'll be a hundred years in five years. I mean, yes. this isn't the way the world was. Uh, so I happen to believe that the individuals that come up with firstly ideas that are great products, which create great brands and they understand how to distribute uh, those products, which involves generally some kind of demonstration, I think it's going to be fabulous, but I think they're, they're going to be harmonized channels. It won't be, oh, this is the only way we sell. It'll be, and a key other word I would say for the future is replace every time you use or with the word and. Here's the last question. What advice would you like to share with this audience? This is Rick Goins to the world that has an interest in tuning in to this kind of conversation. What advice would you give to our audience? Well, I would first, first John, and lastly, say that the, um, the real success is they're going to uh, have is, is, is helping other people. And I always said, it, uh, it's, it's on a, uh, a little uh, post-it note sick on, my, on my desk everywhere I've been that it said, my responsibility is to create an operating landscape where every one of my charges 
has the opportunity to develop their full potential. That's, you start doing that, and that's the biggest beautiful thing about companies that have been really direct selling companies. It's a painting. I mean, it's a, they can be. And so I spend my time, and up at the farm, we have a 24 person conference room. I charge, used to charge the company a buck uh, a year for it. And we would spend three days, not on business strategy, but on personal development strategy on what are the secrets to learn to become the best version of yourself. And I'll tell you, if you have individuals coming in with that attitude, they bring that power to the company and you get uh, passion and purpose out of it. Fantastic. Rick Goins, this is a pleasure. I can't think of a better way to have spent my last hour than to spend it with you. So I know everyone appreciates the fact that you gave us some of your precious time. And uh, I'm gonna say this, you are a legend. Thank you, Rick. And you're a buddy. <laughs> Thank you, my friend.